Hello boys and girls, welcome to episode number six of one-on-one -on -one interviews. Uh, over six months ago when I started to make a list of the candidates who would be guests in one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, I put name of this guy on the top of my <laughs> list. I have several reasons for that and I'm gonna share it with you. But before that, uh, I'm very, very uh, happy that today with us we have director of performance of, as he likes to call it, a Russian powerhouse CSKA basketball, Kostas Chatsikristos. Welcome, my man. Thank it's, you for having me. <laughs> it's Thank a really pleasure, pre pleasure to, to have you here. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that you are part of this I'm project. Happy to be here. I'm and happy to be here. I'm really looking forward to this interview. So, uh, as I said, and I promise that I'm going to give you the reasons why I'm uh, very excited that Kostas is here today. First of all, uh, I have my personal reason uh, because four years ago when I joined Euroleague community, he was one of the first guys that I made contact with. And ever since, he's always there for me to give a uh, friendly advice. So uh, I really, really appreciate it. And I hope we're going to continue in this, sure. in this way. And uh, second reason or reasons uh, are more uh, interesting for you guys because I believe that Kostas has incredible theoretical knowledge but what is even more important he has huge practical experience. He has worked with several basketball teams in Europe. Uh, he also has experience in the United States because he worked at the University of Georgia and currently with CSKA he has two Euroleague titles and he has several VTB championship titles with uh, coach Dimitris Situdis from Greece. Uh, but that's not everything. He's also an entrepreneur. He's a very successful uh, businessman in Greece because he owns uh, his uh, performance center for rehabilitation and sport performance called the Performance 22 Lab that we're going to mention in the, later in, in this interview. And I think I, I said now more than enough so you can be super excited about this interview. I think every minute uh, will be uh, valuable to, to watch and we will cover many different topics. We will talk a little bit about the education system of strength and conditioning coaches in Europe uh, and we will talk about current situation. Uh, later on we're going to talk about youth player development, about in-season periodization, about uh, off-season program. Uh, and so on. So just uh, I, I think next one hour, one hour 30, maybe even two hours is going to be very, very interesting. Uh, I know that I'm super excited about, uh, <laughs> I am uh, too. <laughs> about the questions and, and your answers. So uh, guys, uh, I'm not going to talk anymore. Let's, let's uh, leave this to, to Kostas. So first of all, Kostas, I would like you to tell us a little bit about your journey, uh, especially how you decided to go from Greece to United States and what is even more important, uh, especially when it comes to strength and conditioning. Uh, I don't uh, see very often that someone who goes to United States comes that back. comes back <laughs> to Europe. So I would like to hear a yeah. little bit about well, it. Well, first of all, thanks for the great uh, intro. <laughs> it looks like I'm paying you to say all these great things. Uh, uh, it's always... Uh, it's true. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it was always great talking to you and, uh, you know, having this conversation is a great opportunity to talk about uh, strength and conditioning in our, uh, in our environment in Europe, as we discuss in private, um, just to exchange opinions and see how things are going to get better for, for us here in Europe. Uh, well, my journey started, um, uh, you know, pretty early. I started playing basketball. My family had, had absolutely no connection with, with sports. I, uh, unfortunate event for me, I lost my father when I was 10. And my mother was a dentist. She didn't even have a, a slightest clue about sports, about football or basketball. Uh, she did push us to be active. Uh, and uh, just a, a thing that almost nobody knows is my first sport actually was uh, in, in, uh, in, in grammar school. I was a swimmer. Mm -hmm. and, but then it was uh, horseback riding. Oh, really? So I saw jumping. I was riding horses, which is odd and far away from, from whatever we do right now. People make fun of me all the time when I say that. But, you know, I, I started playing basketball when I was 17 back in the, 
you know, I'm a little older, so it was the Greece's great moment in 1987, uh, 87 when we won the European Championship. Probably you were not born yet, but uh, everybody turned to basketball. So I started playing, and uh, I, uh, I was fortunate enough not to play professionally because that opened up uh, uh, right there when I was 23, 24. I realized I'm not going to be the star that I wanted to be, and uh, I realized that uh, uh, I needed to do something else, and I fell in love with, um, with, uh, with what we do right now, strength and conditioning. And the way it happened is I attended a, um, a clinic, a basketball clinic, I think it was 1990. Four, I want to say, or five, something like that, in Athens, and the the uh, coaches association of Greece put together a great seminar. We had Lenny Wilkins, Pat Riley, uh, uh, Don Nelson, uh, and a whole bunch of other NBA coaches in two weekends, uh, giving seminars. And the Greek uh, uh, coaches association did that very often back in the day. Where they brought great coaches, and part of the Greek success, whatever you know, success we had in basketball is to be, I think you can trace it back to the seminars because it really gave coaches the perspective. And you think about it, it's the 90s, it's pre-internet. You can go on, online and see what these coaches are doing. So you have to actually go and see, and, and we're gonna talk about it later. And I was in the exhibition team, I was 20 something, I was, you know, I was a player and they, I was one of these people that coaches used to show what they wanted to show. And among these people, it was a, a guy named Mark Rabo, Mark Rabo, and at that time, he was a strength and conditioning coach of the Golden State Warriors. Uh, strength and conditioning coach was an basically unknown term in Europe. Um, and he was a guy that worked, you know, try to make play players better. And I remember he used us uh, to, to show how he can do conditioning on the court. And that immediately resonated with me. And I, it was like, you know, you see the, you've seen all these old cartoons when this idea, ping, said, this is what I'm gonna do because I love to work out. My goal was to be a basketball coach, but then I saw this guy and I said, man, I'm, I'm gonna be a strength coach. I must have been one of the first <laughs> ever to think about that in, 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 in Greece for sure. And, but at that time, everything uh, got, uh, you know, I, I found a meaning in my life. I realized, you know, I was studying in school and I, I was in the uh, sports science department. I, you know, didn't have much interest, but after that time, I just realized I want to be a strength coach. And uh, I met Mark several years later, and I told him that in a conference in the U.S., I think we were in San Francisco, and I walked up to him and said, hey, you are the only, you know, for whatever that's worth. I was an unknown kid, a, a student there back then in the U.S., and I just walked up to him and said, you're the only reason that I, I chose this path. He said, all right, great, you know, <laughs> he didn't care. But I understand. But after that, I, I finished playing basketball. I, um, I finished my, the university in, in, in Athens, and I moved on. I, got, uh, I went to the University of Texas, where I got my, uh, educa uh, let's say, the academic background. I uh, studied uh, exercise science and sports nutrition, exercise physiology with a focus on sports nutrition. Uh, and at that time, in Texas, I met uh, Coach Dodd Wright. Now he's, uh, he's with the Clippers. Uh, he's the... Not, I, I, don't know, I don't think he's a head strength coach, but he's working for the, with the Clippers. And he's the one that got me going in the strength and conditioning. He's just my mentor, and I owe almost everything I've done in this sector to him because he was a great mentor and a great friend, and he just showed me the way. And, uh, yeah, after that I got the job in the uh, University of Georgia with Coach Felton. I, I stayed there for, for a year, and I decided, going back to your comment, it was a life decision to come back. Um, I, I thought I, I could see myself staying in the States. I love, I love it over there. I still go. And, uh, but at that point, it was more a personal decision to come back. And I never regretted it because things went well. And we had a chance to start something in, in, in Greece and in Europe in general. So here I am now in, <laughs> in Russia. Life is, life is strange. You never know where he's going to get you. You're from crazy or you just see it in Basconia, right? <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, when did you come back from the United States? Which it year? was 2004. It was right in the Olympics. Uh, Olympics were, the Greece was organizing the Olympics and I came back. I was kind of, was kind of determined to come back, but uh, it was a tough decision because I could see myself staying in the States. I was doing pretty good. Uh, I was in a good track. I was uh, in the University of Georgia. It was a great school. Um, I was you know, right there where I wanted to be, but uh, I decided to come back 2004. I came to uh, a team named Panionios for the people in, that are not really familiar with Greek basketball. Back then, it was always the next 10 years, it was the third, fourth team in Greece, which gave me a great opportunity to, to, uh, to develop my uh, craft. Uh, I was a young strength coach. I thought I knew everything, like all of us, <laughs> when we get out. 
uh, gave me the chance to make mistakes and try new things. Uh, I w uh, it was a team that we, uh, through this team came a lot of talent uh, and I had the opportunity to work with some of them and uh, just uh, try to forge my philosophy. Then I went to Olympiacos for one year. Um, change of coaching staff, you know, the, our reality. Went back to Panionios for another seven years. Very productive, very fortunate to be in this, uh, this environment where I, where I could build my own weight room and just, you know, like I said, develop my philosophy. Uh, then opened my facility, Performance 22. Uh, and after that came Tesca, which is now my sixth year. So that was kind of like the, the whole thing. The whole so story. filled with training and filled with things uh, related to our, to our profession. Perfect, excellent. Can you tell us a little bit more about the idea behind the Performance 22 Lab? Well, you know, I, uh, ever since I, uh, I, I I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit more when I uh, was still in school and I, I saw this seminar that I talked about and I went to my professor who was actually a basketball coach as well and I said, you know, I want to I want to go to the States. And he said, you know, don't go to the States here for coaching, just try to be acquainted with a, a good European basketball coach and try to learn from there. I said, you know what, I want to do, I want to do strength and conditioning. He said, yeah, like for this, you should go. So, um, you know, she just kind of gave me a little more of a push. But coming back, I was, uh, everybody was kind of, nobody knew what strength and conditioning was. You know, everybody was, everybody was, they wanted to get better in, in what they did. They did track and field. I don't know how it was in Croatia, mm -hmm. but it either it's, track and field or, yeah, or nothing. Yeah. So everybody kind of thought I was kind of nuts, you know, doing what, what are you doing? You're going to be a track coach? No, you know, it's different. It's, it's more complicated. It's, it's moving along. We have to catch up. And, and then uh, my first summer, I had five, four or five different people wanted to do off-season training, which is unheard of. Now, Greece is Greece. You know, it's sun, it's beach. Season finishes, everybody goes to the beach. Uh, the, the crazy ones... Two or three of them would do track and field. The rest of them go to the beach, meet in September, go for eight eight weeks of preseason. Which now, if you think <laughs> about it, it's nuts. You know, I've done it yeah. as an athlete and as a coach. I've wrote articles. Oh, you should do seven or eight weeks of preseason because you did nothing in the summer. You need you need two months to get back. So, um, so it was the first four, and then the next summer I had about forty, and it kept escalating to a point where it became. Uh, you know, all my free time was dedicated in coaching. And that was great because I saw, my sounds a little bit strange because I was in a pretty high level team. We played Euro Cup, we, we played EuroLeague for one year, but uh, I also trained so many people on the side. And what this gave me was, uh, uh, you know, this, this 10,000 hours of, of everybody's talking to, about, about, about practice, about getting better, about working with kids, about injured kids, uh, healthy kids, uh, professionals, uh, you name it. I saw in those six, seven years before I opened the actual place, I built my clientele, I built the people that are actually following me in a, in a situation where nobody else was doing that in Europe at that time. And I see in Greece, I don't want to say about Europe, but um, and that gave me the opportunity to first practice a lot and then build my, my base. And then I went and opened up my own facility and my idea was in the beginning to, to combine medical with, with training because the two professions are, are, are bind together. You know, it's one body, as we all talk about it in, in between us, and we are fragmented. Doctors, things like doctors, physios, things like physios, trainers, things like trainers, but there's one body. And the ideal, the, the hybrid professional is a doctor, physio, strength coach, which is kind of a utopia. It's hard to happen. But we need all these different things to happen in during 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 one hour training. Let's say you train somebody that has, let's not go to ACL. Let's go to somebody that has a minor problem. Well, you need a doctor to evaluate the physio to give the, to give you their their take and your expertise in training. So, what we did was we partnered with uh, with two great physios and and two great doctors, and we uh, basically built Performance Twenty Two. Uh, lab, as we call it, uh, which is in Athens, and it's just is a collaboration of is the is the common is the one the global view, as we say, of of the human body with three different perspectives. So this is and you know I had a, a one of our, my players came back to uh, to Greece two two years ago. One guy from Tesca, he had a shoulder problem, and uh, I don't want to say the name, but 
I had one of my guys examine him and the doctor, and then he came to do some exercises. And he said to me, like, you see, he looked at me, it was summer, I was in Greece, and he said, you look happier here. And I said, you know why I'm happier? Because right here I can be the best strength coach in the world, because these guys over there, my physios and the doctors, they solve all the problems. I don't have to guess about anything, you know, I just, here it is, hey, do this, do this, do this, go to this door, do this. Uh, little pain here, okay, let's check him. I have a great surgeon taking a look at him, no problems. As safe as you can get, I can be very effective. Unfortunately, and to go, you know, kind of mingle the questions here, but this is one of our problems in Europe that we need to build better teams, and we'll, we'll address it later, I guess. So the idea behind Performance 22 was to build a place where it combines everything. Excellent. That was it. Yeah. Excellent. And I know that in the center behind the amazing care that you provide for professional athletes, on the other hand, you also try to work with young strength and conditioning coaches Absolutely, yeah. uh, from, from Athens, and there is a strong mentorship program over there. So I would like to hear a little bit because our audience, I, I believe, is uh, like more or less younger generations. So I would like to uh, see like from your own eyes as a, as a mentor, when you are uh, having the interviews for internships in, in Performance 22 Lab, what are the, the main qualities of these interns that you are looking for? Just in order to share with them a little bit the point of view of of the uh, experienced coach and, and the mentor? Well, I'll, I'll start with this, that uh, I feel that, first of all, I feel a personal obligation to uh, pass on what was given to me. And um, I'll say story, I like to say story. Obviously, you realize I like to talk, <laughs> but uh, I was in a, back in 1996, I was in a volunteer program in uh, somewhere in America again, in San Francisco. Um, doing environmental work. So we were in, in Hutter Park outside of San Francisco building trails. Absolutely not related with sports. But uh, at that time I was, um, you know, I wanted to, 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 to rent a car. And I was below, I was under 24 in the States you can't rent a car unless you're over 24. And I was just going through the catalog, no internet at that time, just going through the, the catalog and trying to rent a car. And everybody denied me. And there was a park ranger a park ranger, the guy that helped, you know, we helped them build the trails. And all of a sudden he takes a $20, that's a 100% real story. He takes a $20 bill out of his pocket. He thought I didn't have money to rent a car, but I was being turned down because I was under 24. But he thought I didn't have money, so he gave him 20 bucks. And I said, oh, no, 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 it's, that's not it. You know, it's, I, they just turned me down because I'm not 24, I can't rent a car. He said, take the $20. And I said, when am I going to see you again? I'm not going to see you again. He said, look. And I swear to God, I say it again, it's a true story. So take this $20 bill, use it on your car, and then pass it on to somebody else. And then this good is going to come back to me. And this $20 bill was going to come back to me. And I was like 23 years old, didn't know nothing. I was cocky, you know, like a little kid. And, and it, just, it just amazed me. And why I say this story is because when I went to the States, I was this kid from Greece. Nobody knew me. I didn't know anybody. Uh, and I went to Todd Wright, and I said, I want, to, I want to be a strength coach, I come from Greece, I want to observe, I want to just come and watch. He said, all right, just come. And he just took me by the hand and lifted me up. And I feel a, a moral obligation to do the same thing to whoever comes in, and not to whoever, but people that are, you can tell they're passionate, is an obligation to just give them as much as you can and try to you know, give, them a, give them a small push. You, know, you don't own anybody, you, nobody owns you nothing, but that's, that's part of the mentorship and internship that we have. We have a, a six-month internship program in Performance 32 where you have to show up for three hours a day. And I know in the States that sounds funny, but in Europe this is, this is a lot. Um, and people observe what we do and then they can interact with the coaches and the therapists and they just kind of get into to the, to the business. And I'm proud to say that three of the strength coaches in Greece that work in the pro level are, let's say, our kids. And I'm really proud of that, and they're doing great. And I hope they become much better than, than I am. Um, and we have this mentorship program that we kind of, this year, going to do it a little more organized, where it's going to be weekly, a weekly deal where you observe in the morning all of our pros or whoever trains there. And then in the afternoon, you get some time to talk and just analyze and ask questions. But it's going to be done in a more structured way with some manuals to give out. So, so people that come in actually get get more from, from this experience, more organized, just 
not just just staying there and just occasionally talk. It's going to be more more structured. So, and I believe you know what we're missing in Europe, and like I see you have these questions down the road. Um, we're missing that that uh, mentorship, that uh, helping you know the younger professionals grow. And teams are very closed. Uh, I don't think. I don't know in, of a lot of teams that have internship programs as opposed to the MBA or the NCAA that is full of GAs and in, interns and things like that. And here we're very close. We're very, um, it's like a cult, I would want to say. And it, this has to change because the younger people, like we learn from the, from the more experienced guys, we need to pass on whatever experience we have to the younger people and then hope that they're going to get better than us and just, you know, push the envelope a little bit more. So. I, I totally see it like that. I, I never hide anything. I'm not this guy that's going to not show anything or keep it for myself. I just want to give as much as I can and, you know, at the same process, uh, at the same time, learn because we learn from, from the, the kids that come, they ask questions, they, they challenge us, um, they, have, they bring their generation's questions in, and uh, it's, it's, it's very uh, invigorating for us too. Excellent. Excellent. I, I really like it. So uh, in order to somehow repeat uh, yeah. your words, basically what you're looking for uh, at first is the, the passion of, well, of young interns. Because you asked that and, and you're right, we should address it. First of all, I want to see somebody that is serious uh, and he wants to be a strength or she. Uh, and we need more girls. We need more women coming into the profession for many reasons. Well, let's not touch it. Not because there's some kind of like divine equality that should be met, but because they're going to bring so much more to the game. But uh, the first thing I look for is somebody that really wants to be a strength coach because a lot of people come in, not a lot, but some people come in and say, you know, I want to be a basketball coach and I want to learn more about training people. So that, you know, you're not that kind of person that we're looking for, you know, we, because we are also investing a lot of time and a lot of uh, energy and, and we actually count on you to, to produce and to be great. So I don't want to, I don't want to say waste my time because these people also have their, their own dreams, but uh, I'm looking for somebody that's passionate to be a strength coach, that is passionate to learn. Another great feature, I think this is one of the, of the main thing, and I think you will agree that you, I'm looking for, for, for people that, that can work with other people. Mm, you know, you might have, because we had kids coming from Serbia, or I remember one particular case, and or people come in that's super smart, but they can't work well with people that come in to do their own thing. And you know what? Being knowledgeable is part of it, but it's not all of it. You need to be able to function in a team and take criticism and, 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 and do things that you might not really agree with. So being able to, to work with people is great, is huge. Taking responsibility is also huge. Taking responsibility has two, two parts of it. One is do your job, you know, it's just, uh, if, I t if you're expected to do something, we tell you to do something, you need to do it. And if coach tells you to train the people, you need to train them. You know, you can't, there's no other way around it. But also we need to, I like when people are proud for the little thing they're doing. If, 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 we, if I tell somebody, hey, please clean this corner of the weight room, they must be, this is the thing. They got to be excited just to clean this. This is going to be the, the cleanest weight room that ever has been, you know, has ever been. Just take responsibility of what you want to do. Work well with people be passionate, wanting to learn. Uh, our, you know, our profession is a knowledge-based profession. You need to be able to, you need to learn throughout your life if you want to be successful, if you want to be to a service to your athletes, basically, and to your coaches. Mm -hmm. It's not about us, it's about them. Uh, if, you're not, if you don't know enough about situation, if you're not willing to learn, because nobody knows, it's such, such a complex and such a, a wide, uh, let's say, uh, knowledge base that we need to have from nutrition to physiology to anatomy to to to, to whatever whatever strength coaches need to, to know um, you need to be able to, to learn and willing to learn you need to kill your ego again I'll say it's not about us it's about the athlete and as much as we want to get our name written somewhere and get some acknowledgement this is only going to happen through our athletes and one thing I always say is that we're like planets you know planets where do they get the light from the stars Right? Your planets don't have their own light, it goes back to physics, which you also need to know if you're a strength coach. But it's not about you, it's about the athlete. If they do well, then maybe somebody will say something good about you. And if they don't say something good, that's fine. You know, just make sure you do your job and you're going to get your credit. So we're looking for these traits, uh, you know, passionate people. Uh, and you're looking for people that are resilient, 
very important. And this is, a, a, I think, a problem of this generation. They are just a little bit pampered. Uh, everything they, they, are, they are very empowered and very, uh, let's say, they have a lot of rights. But no, some people forget that they also have uh, obligations and you're going to work 10 hours a day. When I started working, no, no, not, I don't want to put it on myself, everybody that did something. Well, our, our day in Georgia started at 5 a.m. Uh, I woke up at 5 and the first session was at 6. When I was working in Texas with Todd Ryder at his, uh, his place, trained for the game, which still exists. And we started it and we st had golfers starting at 6 a.m., starting training at 6 a.m. And, uh, and I didn't like it, and, uh, you know, but you got to wake up from, at 5 o'clock and go on up until, you know, 6, 7 in the afternoon and you're not, not going to make much. So this is it. You cho our profession is, is hard like our professions and you have to have the, the resilience and the, and the, and the work ethic to, to last. Teams are a little bit different. Uh, our life is a little bit easier in terms of work hours. It's a different type of obligation, different type of, uh, type of responsibility. But um, you have to have this work ethic and I hate people that are looking at the clock and you know. And another personal story is that uh, at some point after about several months that I was working with Todd Wright, he, he said, he called me up and said, let's go for a beer. For me, that was like, I'm going to go for a beer with Coach. And we sat down there in, in Austin, Texas, we where I did my master's in the University of Texas, by the way. And he said, uh, amongst other things that we talked about, he said, Kay, he called me Kay, he said, there's some, some people in life that get it and some don't. And I keep saying that quote, some people get it. Like, what do I don't need to explain to you. Like, you get it. You come in the waiting room, you, you, you stand the right way, you stand in the right spot, you say the right things, and, and you get it. Um, and I've seen a lot of people that don't get it. They don't get how, they, how, they, uh, how they're going to be successful. The biggest thing in all of us and in these people is ego. You got you to gotta contain your ego. You got to have ego because without a strong self-confidence and belief in yourself, you cannot do anything, but it has to be uh, at that, it has to stop at some point and, and just be, you know, a little bit humble. I, I believe in humbleness and and this coming for a little bit of a narcissistic person, <laughs> you know, so this is what we're looking for, for, for from people, so Excellent. I don't know if it makes sense. <laughs> no, no, it makes complete sense. I, I really like it and the answer was pretty detailed. Uh, but. Uh, now I would like to expand it a little bit and it goes now towards basically uh, your opinion on what builds success for strength and conditioning coaches. Now you said like what is the, the base and I think uh, the traits that you said are the traits of young coaches that should not have it only as interns, sure. whether it's like one or two years internship programs in different places. It's something that you need to have for the first five to ten years at least of your uh, career. I would, say for, I would say for life. Yes, yes, yes definitely. Yeah. But this is like the, mo the priority in the fi first five to ten years. And what else would you add on this that will make you successful in the long term? Like if you want to make 15, 20, 25 year old uh, 25 year career. Well, f first of all, you have to, to, to determine what is success for you. Um, and that, that is important because we all start, you know, we were in school and we all started with, uh, in my, my situation, it was like three or four of us in the master's program in Texas and we all dreamed about becoming NCAA strength and conditioning coaches. Down the road, you realize that this is not the path for everything. Why we were thinking about that? Because probably our mentor and our leader, let's say, was an NCAA successful strength coach. Uh, down the road, you have to see what is success for you, and uh, and that generally in life, this is hard to determine because we're, you start your life and you're thinking you want to make money or you want to be in that spot. And during the the, the, the path that you start working, and, I mean, along the path that you start walking, you realize it's not for you. Uh, but it's important to have a blueprint of success. What is a template of success? What is what is success for you? And for me, it was always what I you know. It was exactly what I ha I'm having right now in the previous years. I wanted to be a strength conditioning coach for an elite basketball team. Um, and on the side, doing my own things because um, I just had more interests. And it doesn't have to do anything with money. Uh, money in our profession, nobody came in to become a strength conditioning coach to become a millionaire. I think there's some of them in the States or 
and they, this is great, but we didn't get into it for, for the money. So first of all, determine, have a blueprint, have a template of success because this is your roadmap. This is, this, this is gonna tell you if decision A or decision B is right, is if you know, is this gonna take me closer to what I, th I wanna be or not? Uh, this is the first one, and the, uh, it kind of sounds theoretical, it kind of sounds like a self-help advice, but it's very important. I, speaking about myself because it's my, my interview, I, I, I remember I was driving down the road and my brother, my brother works in, uh, in banking. He has absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with basketball. And the funny story is when we won the, the EuroLeague in 2016 in Berlin, he called me up on Monday and said, hey, what's up, everything's good, yeah. I said, well, what, you had a game yesterday, did you win? So yeah, we're we're European champions. We won the Euro. Oh, it's great. Uh, so next week I'm coming to Greece. So let's go for a, for a mountain bike thing because it's our thing. It's, so you know, okay. You so, but uh, you say he was very concerned about me. So what are you, you going to do with this degree? You know, he's in. He was working in New York in a big bank. I said, you know what? I was driving down the road. I said, you know, I'm going to finish up. Uh, I'm finishing up school. Go to Texas. I, I was already accepted. I'm going to finish Texas, I'm going to be in the, in the NCAA, and then I'm going to be in a, a strength, coach, strength coach in a professional team. That was it. I was very lucky that it actually happened. I honestly believe that. I, I, and we talk about it, what, it, what it takes to be successful. you got to be lucky. you got to be lucky. And if you're, not, you're, you're delusional if you think that luck has nothing to do with it. Uh, it has a lot to do with it. And I can give you a lot of examples. But... Uh, the blueprint was there. This is what I didn't want to be a, a personal trainer. I didn't want to be a, you know, like a consultant. I just want to do this. So have a blueprint. Hard work, hours and hours and hours of training. You gotta hone. You gotta. You gotta perfect your skill. You gotta perfect your 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 craft. And that's easy to say, but it's hard to do. It, we're talking about hours of training, of standing up, of uh, of coaching, of uh, of uh, talking to people, and you can you you know how. You know how uh, stressful it can be to, to to interact with tens of people, like so many people during the day, because they basically carry to you their problems. So, work ethic is great. You have to to be able to sustain long hours. You have to be able to take risks. And all of us to Croatia. You left from Croatia to come here in one day. Probably uh, somebody called you and say, "Hey, there's an opportunity," and you didn't think enough a lot. You didn't know much better anyways, <laughs> you just went and you said, I'm going to make it. I don't know what's there, but I'm going to make it. And to me, it happened many times. And I went from Texas to, to uh, Arizona to Exos, which was an amazing experience. And, I'm, you know, obviously, again, Todd arranged it for me. And I met Mark Verstegen and these guys. And I was fortunate to interact for some time with them. It's a great school. And, but it happened in a night. You know, say, do you want to go? Yeah, I want to go. My two American colleagues said no because they already planned the summer. I already planned my summer. I was planning to go to Greece. But I said, hey, I'm going to athlete's performance. It was back then called. Yeah, I'm, I'm out. I'm, I'm going. So I'm there. Then uh, I was, you know, Greece came calling. When I was in the States, I took a huge risk, taking a huge step towards that. And, and you got to be able to take risks and believe. Believe in yourself. And um, I don't think there's, there's, there's a, there are whole books written about success, about work ethic, about the approach and everything. But I think this is, you know, uh, have a goal, work hard, have a, have, believe in yourself, take risks. And if you, if you fail a little bit, you just, you just knew and you found out another way where things are not going to happen. I opened my business with, in the worst possible moment in European history of economics is Greece in 2012, I'm telling you. It was my, my people that are, that are any any way related to Europe or, you know, economics. It's minus 25% of GDP is like wartime uh, reduction. Usually when we talk about recessions, we talk about 1% or 2%, which is 25 So I took a leap of faith and I said, I'm going to do it because if I'm not going to do it now, I'm not going to do it if, never. So I took the, the step and, and, and so on and so, so forth. And I'm sure everybody took their risks. Everybody that ever did anything in their lives, they did risk. They took risks, and uh, even failure is is just another way, you know, to find out what you, you know, did wrong. And again, this sounds something out of a health uh, self help book, but it's true. I just followed the the advice of uh, 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 Richard Branson that said, take risks, but make sure if if you fail, you don't end up living in your car. So don't put your house in a mortgage, you know, like to get some loan and then the bank takes your house. So just have a, always have a reality check, believe in yourself. And I wanted to say that previously, believe in yourself, but have a reality check. 
somebody that is going to hate you. Is that realistic? Because we have, I've been in many situations where kids come up to us, uh, to me and say, I want to train. And I, the first thing I ask is, what's your goal? And most, most kids don't have goals. Like they say, I want to be a professional basketball player. That's not a goal. I want to play in, in Olympiacos because we're in Greece or in, in, in Basconia in three years. Uh, and I want to play there. That's a goal. It's, it's measurable. It's specific and it has a time frame. So that is a goal, but you need to have a, a you know, you need to have some kind of a, of a of check because if you're 180, 175 in height and you're 16 and you're never 17 and you haven't picked, never been picked in any elite teams, you're not going to play in the NBA. I'm sorry. You know, if so that goes for us too. You need to have real goals that are just a little bit above of what you think you can do. Mm -hmm. So these are attainable goals, in my opinion. Brilliant, brilliant. I, I really like this part because it's, it's uh, something that it's like inspiration for definitely for, for younger guys. And I think everything what you said is, is a sm small piece of, of uh, success story, you know. So. It, it can be. I mean, it's, it's all about attitude and, and luck. Like I said, you know, if you really think of what are the odds for some of us to be here, there's... You know, Europe is, I, I don't know who's going to watch this, but uh, there's very, very few good jobs out there. And it's part of our, yours and mine, because you're in a good position as well. Uh, it's part of our responsibility to raise awareness and, and create more for, for, the, for the younger people uh, because it's worth it. And it, it's something that what we do helps our athletes. And you, you can't go, you cannot start off and think, oh, you know, how many teams are out there? Well, there's only five or six good jobs and like, you know, 10,000 strength coaches, who's going to get those jobs? Well, you might be one of them. Mm -hmm. You never know. Just, just keep going and, and it worked out for you and, and it worked out for me. And I never expected, if you, if you ask me, and again, this is another personal story. I grew up in 90, watching all these great players in 1987, old names, most of our viewers don't know. Like, let's say, imagine you've grown up with uh, watching, what are the big names of, of your, like Decolo and these guys just playing. And they're your, your player and they're your, they are your idols. And then 10 years later, they, they are retired and you work with the same team with them. So I, I, I got to meet all these guys that, that I had on, on, on my wall. Memo you know, they, he was my coach, he was my GM and people bringing the kids to me. And I was just, if you ask me when I was 20 years old, that, what do you think, how do you think your life is gonna be related to that? I was like, this, by no chance I'm gonna ever meet or be in the same room with these people so dream uh but dreaming is not not enough you just gotta walk the, the walk you know it's, it's hard work yeah perfect perfect you remind me like when you said now you shared your story about taking risks and and, and waiting for your op opportunity keep like keeping that in mind and when when the opportunity comes you have to be yeah. right there to to make the right call absolutely yeah, i remember when when i got the call from igor uh, i was actually in china I was in China. I yeah, woke up like funny, I was. Yeah. I was at one tennis tournament because I had like a short break from from basketball, and I was following one Russian guy, uh, who was professional tennis player. And we, we we were in China for two weeks, and I woke woke up one morning and I saw like 15 missed calls uh, from Igor, and I, I called him right yeah, away. Wrong. <laughs> something, <laughs> something, something is something's wrong. Something something yeah. is really really wrong. And I called him, and he said like. Hey, uh, you have next 30 minutes to decide yeah, if you're no. coming to Spain or not. And I had to call my girlfriend and we just started to, to date. Like now she's my fiance, well, <laughs> but back then she was my girlfriend. This is part of the deal though. If, if we're talking about life, you know, you exactly. want somebody with you that is going to support it. When Cozy to this, uh, called me up and, uh, he said, uh, I didn't know coach. Uh, I would just said hi and hello. And during our Greek league games and we'd never uh, yeah, we never had a lot of contact and he called me up and said, says Scott, and I said, I said, yes, I, you know, I, I actually met uh, his assistant, uh, Andreas Pistiolis, uh, because he was already, in, coach was already in Moscow and my wife that day was having an operation of diaphragm, so she was in the hospital and I didn't tell her nothing and I just went home and I, I went to the hospital after that, she just, just woke up from from uh, from you know narcosis was a perfect time for me. <laughs> she just didn't really know what was going on, and I just laid it out. I said, "Hey, we have great uh, opportunity," and just uh, she didn't realize what was going on. But it was, I told her oh, we're going to Moscow, 
And right there is just uh, another like test, life test is, you know, just, is this person that is next to me the right person that support is going to support all that or not? So like you, you, know, you have to call everybody and just make a decision on a, on a snap. And these are the decisions that define you because a lot of people would say no. And I've been in this, I've, I had, we had interns that worked really hard for us and, you know, at Performance 22 Lab. And, uh, and the time came for them to take that leap of faith. And uh, some of them didn't. And there were some good jobs out there in Europe because they had to leave Greece and go to Europe. Are you ready? No, I'm not ready. I don't feel ready. So you're never gonna feel ready. You are never gonna feel ready. Uh, I don't know if you remember your first workout. What was your first? My first workout was, so I'm, I'm uh, interning at, at Texas and I get this job at the University of Georgia. I go over there, I interview with the other two guys. I finally get the job and I'm supposed to be there two weeks later. So I go, Coach Felton, Dennis Felton now, uh, he calls me up and says, hey, hey Costas, can you come a week earlier? Uh, because we need to start, we already started. It was a little bit late in the, in the preseason. And uh, I had to pack my, so it's a long story. I had to buy a new car because I had an old Mercedes, didn't drive that much. And, and I bought a, a red Chevy truck. I loaded up with my stuff and I drove all the way out to, to, to Georgia. And uh, it was a two day drive from Texas to Georgia. And I'm, I arrived there on a Saturday night and I'm supposed to be introducing the team on Monday afternoon and just coach calls me up on Sunday night. There was some discipline issue that, that came up and he said, you need to do the punishment run on Monday morning, 6 a.m. All right, so it's my first ever coaching job. I am never coached basketball. I played basketball, I never coached basketball player. I did personal training uh, over there with Todd and I assisted him, but this is my team. and. This team just won the SEC title the year before, so they're not some kids, they're just champions. So I'm showing up at 6 a.m. and some weird ass name, Costas Hadzi Christos, you know, just Greek guy. And it was just an awkward moment where I just put up there, first time in their lives they did dynamic warm up, that's 2003, right? So it's just, what are we doing? We're like knee hugs and things like that. And that was my first work. I said, it's, it's either this or, you know, all or nothing. I'm just gonna do my thing. I'm just going to do whatever I believe. And I gave a little, small, a little speech. I didn't even remember what I said. I, that didn't even matter. It was 6 a.m. in the morning, right? It's a punishment, right? It was 30 suicides. It was 20 suicides. 20 suicides in 26 seconds, I think. Down and back, one-on-one. So some crazy run that coach had to do. And I had to, you know, administer that. So it was, it was not easy. But it's take that leap of faith. You got to do it. <laughs> That's really interesting. When you, when you compare... Uh, now you have experience from from us and you're very very familiar with uh, what is happening over there especially when it comes to education system mm -hmm. uh, when you would compare europe to to us system uh, what would be uh, good things about europe and what would be the bad things well you know europe i think is catching up uh, gradually um, when i first started in 2003 uh, it was way behind, like we discussed, it was just, it was either going to be a track and field or just some gym doing bodybuilding. Uh, the, the concept of performance training or functional training uh, was non-existent. It started in Europe right around 2010 or 2011. And I think CrossFit brought a lot of firepower with it, making people familiar with all these type of uh, uh, training methods and also the internet. Because, uh, because this is something I want to say. Be before, because I, I kind of alluded to that in the beginning of the conversation, if you wanted to learn in the early, in the late 90s or the early uh, 2000s, you, you had to call up a coach and that coach, that, that interested you, like you call somebody and then they have to accept you and you have to fly there and you have to sit in their gym like this gym and, and observe and then ask some questions. And if you're really lucky, they talk to you and they give you a videotape and this is how you, you, you obtain knowledge. And it was hard, so very, very few people got to do it. And only the people that were really driven and they, they were accepted. Now with the internet, you can go in and get all these courses, YouTubes, Instagrams, you name it. So there's so much information out there that's completely different with knowledge, but this is a different topic, but uh, it was very, very hard to learn. So we came in at a time where, where Europe was just desert. Um, the U.S. has a huge advantage in, in terms of facilities, funding, uh, big universities, big professional teams with a, with a lot of revenue, and uh, they invest a ton of money, as you know, in technology and, and, and facilities. 
And that's something that in Europe we, we're, we're yet to catch up and, and, and realize the value of creating some really good environment for our athletes. Education opportunities and, uh, are limited in Europe, I think. Uh, very few people that are, accept coaches to, to interact and very few good people, I, I regret to say. Um, and uh, not a lot of seminars, not a lot of learning opportunities. Um, uh, what we have now as a strength and conditioning system comes from the U.S. And we are kind of taking the system and adapting it to our, our, our situation. And then we're creating our own system gradually, but it comes from the U.S. It used to be kind of the, uh, the mid-90s after the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of knowledge came to the U.S. and it was really sought after. A lot of coaches went to work, especially with Olympic lifting and, and things like that. But we have to be, to be like realistic. Most of the knowledge comes from there. Most of the innovation comes from the U.S., so facilities, knowledge is huge. Um, yeah, Europe has a problem that it's not a unified uh, culture. We're different countries, language barriers, culture barriers, a little bit of a, um, you know, like a struggle between nations, I would say. Everybody got their own best. We have the best strength coach, the best, the best. Everybody has the best, but it's not a competition. <laughs> we don't, we're not looking to find the best. We're just looking to to do something that maybe <laughs> find the truth. Uh, and, um, but we're making progress, I think, in Europe. It's more people coming. And most, most of the people that come to work in Europe, they're schooled outside of Europe. Now we have some universities that are starting building up the strength and conditioning programs. Well, we don't have mentorship. We don't have internship culture. Not programs, culture. Uh, and we need to make steps towards that. So. I think that the, 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 the good thing is that, you know, there's, there's two ways to look at it. There's a, a huge room for, impro for improvement um, and uh, we, should, we should, you know, move towards that. that uh, uh, um, I say take a step towards improving things. Good thing about Europe is that if we talk about basketball, European basketball is something in, the, in between the NBA and, the co and college. So we get a lot of more uh, opportunities to coach and apply our knowledge. Uh, NBA is a little bit different as far as I know. NCAA is, has a lot of restrictions in terms of how many hours you can work with the guys. You get a certain ages. For example, take, a, take, a, take a, for example your, your situation. You got veterans, you got people in the prime, you got young guys you need to develop, and they're all important. So you get to, to work with them, you get to plan them, you can, you can tell them come in the weight room, they have no um, you know, they have to come. There's no choice of not coming, like in maybe in the NBA. But uh, that's uh, one thing that is good about Europe. It's, it's you get more coaching opportunities, I think, mm -hmm. in more situation. But we have we have long ways to cover for our profession, I think. Excellent. How do you see coaches' ed education in Europe in the next three, five, ten years, uh, considering that like we are looking for the improvements? Mm -hmm. And then what would you suggest as really good model of education system? My thing is uh, teams, organizations in soccer, in, in, in soccer, I'm not football or whatever we call it here in Europe. Uh, uh, I'm not so familiar with the culture. I, I have a lot of friends and a lot of connections and, and try to follow what's happening. But we definitely need to, to get uh, to this uh, internship, mentorship uh, mentality because that's the best way to learn. The best way to learn is get somebody from, with a good education and then put them, on the actual, put them to interact with coaches and, and learn from their experience and then create their own. Um, and teams are reluctant, they're, they're afraid, coaches are afraid that somebody's going to steal the knowledge, teams are afraid that their real secrets are going to go out in the public, but uh, I think we're talking about a generation of, of, of coaches that are coming that are very conscious, that, and, and we had this conversation in, in Ceska, and, and rightly so, the, the management thought that they don't want anybody working for us without money, and I deeply respect that. Uh, what they're, I think, missing is that no kid that is no young coach that is coming in is going to say after two months, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore, I'm leaving. Because it's professional suicide. So it's our, our responsibility to pick right. And uh, it's it just people that are going to come in are just going to be so delighted and so obliged that they're not going to leave. And uh, it, you, you mentioned education, I think mentorship, internships are huge. Uh, universities need to, to 
to put in their curriculums more practical, um, uh, let's say, uh, classes, and they need to connect with the real world. And in Greece, we have some some departments and universities that actually start this this conversation. And kids are, are the, the 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 students are thirsty to to learn from to know what we do and uh, to learn how the real thing functions. And I am also I very eager to tell them that is things are not like you think there are. <laughs> you know, the, there's a, the, you'd be surprised from a lot of things that are happening and so many, many things that we have to improve through their knowledge and their fire that's coming in. Uh, so more, you know, ed educational university programs that are sound scientifically, uh, they're more geared to strength and conditioning, more opportunities for the practical and theoretical worlds to blend more giving from our part, uh, from our knowledge. And my big thing is, is, I don't see it happening anytime soon, and maybe it's a, it's a utopic, but we need to create that hybrid coach that knows, the strength coach that knows medicine, physiotherapy, and training. I think these, these things you just cannot separate, and we can go in, we can be talking for hours about that, but we do need to have that knowledge mm -hmm. of strength coaches definitely need to get into the medical world. Not to become doctors, not to make diagnosis, but then we need to speak the same language because at the end of the day, you know, maybe half of our work is rehab or post rehab, whatever you want to call it. Somebody's with knee pain that needs to, to play and you need to train him. So where, you know, you, you need to have some kind of medical understanding over there, how, how first not to do harm and then how to do good. And if, if strength coaches need to study for, for seven years, eight years, yeah, well, so be it. Excellent, excellent. I like the point. I like the point. Anyway, like uh, without lifelong learning. Sure. I'm, I'm talking about like college learning, university learning. Uh, you, need to, you need to learn anatomy to the medical level. But how, how else are you going to rehab an ankle? Uh, uh, or what I, we, we, even, even our lingo is just ankle sprain. There's no ankle sprain. There's so many structures down there that it's no ankle sprain. You need to, to know exactly what happened and where the muscles go and where the, the ligaments go and in which angle the, each muscle works and at that angle, what uh, is the cartilage uh, being involved and how are you gonna learn all that? This is, this is medicine. And when the, the, when the doctor comes in and says, oh, okay, well, you know what? We just had a, an unfortunate event happen to one of our athletes, he just had an ACL. And I need to talk to the doctor and he, to explain what he did so I can, in, in the knee so I can proceed with the, with, the, with the strengthening after the physio is done, well, I need to speak the same language. I need to understand the techniques that he used, what exactly he did, what structure were affected, the healing times of, of, of each tissue, the reaction of the body and everything. How are you gonna learn that? You need to study that. So, oh, no, 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 this is, this is medicine. Yeah, well, there's a big thing in Greece and in, and, and in Europe and in the world in general, yeah, you probably heard about it, exercise is medicine. Well, great. Well, do you know medicine? You know, ex do you know medicine? No. How, so you're not, we know exercise, but we cannot connect it with, you know, with medicine. Physios are, the physios want to grade at, at this little box that they're doing, but they want, they go into, to, to strengthening and they just limit it there. We're great in exercise, but we're very limited in, in, in therapy. So we just need to blend all those things, you know? Yeah. So I have a really uh, nice example from my uh, practical experience where right mentality of uh, lifelong learning and education, uh, Oscar Bilbao, who was 20, for 25 years strength and conditioning coach of Basconia, uh, the year when he stopped being strength and conditioning coach, when I came, he decided to uh, devote himself to rehab. And he, at the age of 50 something, he applied for university master studies in sports rehab he finished his master program he's still uh, reading and educating himself that's every just, day that's just amazing you know and that's that's the whole point i think we discussed it uh, uh, between us and uh, yeah, i said you know if, if whenever this journey ends uh, with the teams and uh, i just want to go back to school just for me I, i'm not in, aspiring to, to do anything you know but i just want to do physical therapy and, and I had this conversation with our doctors at the performance. I said, in another life, I would like to start as a doctor and then move on. I just want to have that knowledge so I can even understand the human body better and, and do what I love in a more rounder way instead of just trying to, you know, like you said, lifelong education and with seminars and reading. And, but I have so much respect for Oscar. Like, 
because he loves what he does and he feels that it's so much more like we all feel but it's no time a lot of obligations and and uh, you know it's not easy to go back to school for sure but uh, this is what it needs to happen you need to have all this this rounded uh, this rounded knowledge um, obviously have great professionals around you because it cannot be one month show but we do need we need we definitely need to upgrade uh, our our learning I think and it's, it's a little pr pr premature in Greece I don't know what's happening in the rest of Europe this big fight between physios and strength coaches and who is responsible of doing what and I just you know it's just yeah. Blend it. You just not. We have to see it in a different way. We need to just unite. Uh, uh, we need to get to. Uh, we need to attend more medical uh, uh, conferences and physio conferences, and then we need to create talks and and courses that are addressed to, to these type of of professionals. And we, so we need to understand. And what is the what is the goal? The goal is to help these people that come to us and say, "My knee is hurting," and we just want to help them. When we have athletes that 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 you know, have some problem and you want to help them so bad, but you realize that you don't have all the, the tools. And it's not, we have to admit that. You know, sometimes, well, yeah, I'll, I'll fix you. Well, do you really know what you're doing right now? Or do you know everything that you need to know? Not always. So, and that's something that, that we need to acknowledge also, not be so ego, oh, I can do that. I'm definitely guilty of that in er earlier in my career. You know, but I know everything. No, just, you gotta be humble. You, 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 you get hit in the head a couple of times and you say, okay. <laughs> the most important thing, thing is to, to learn from these kind of things. Absolutely. It's, it's hard. You know, life teaches you. You yeah, just throw you down. But and, it's possible. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, great, guys. End of the part one and we are coming back uh, very soon.